Okay, so you remember that um, last week we talked about all the hot spots throughout the world that were turning to communism. So of course, people started to get suspicious. Why is communism spreading? It must be spreading in the United States as well. And so just to kind of review what we did on Friday, there were three main events that kind of made us very suspicious. First of all, at the height of World War II, there were 80,000 Americans that were actually members of the Communist Party. It's not illegal to do that, but it was a concern for us, obviously. Uh, 1945, some secret American documents were stolen and ended up being published in a communist magazine. So we're wondering who in the world is doing such a thing. And then there was a communist spy ring that was busted in Canada. So that was pretty darn close to home. So people were really worried about that. So um, the United States put together HUAC, which stands for House Un-American Activities Committee. And this was a committee designed to hunt down communists in Hollywood. Because of course, as people are watching movies, watching TV, listening to the radio, People are being influenced by their ideas. So they started pulling people in. And if you remember, we said there were two kinds of groups. There were friendlies, and these were the people that said, oh yes, there's communism in Hollywood. In fact, people like uh, Gary Cooper over here on the right claimed he turned down quite a few scripts because they had communist ideas in them. Um, and then there were other people like Ronald Reagan and even Walt Disney that were friendlies. And what they would do is instead of having the finger pointed at them, because they might end up losing their job, they would say, oh yeah, Wyatt over there is a communist. It must be him. So they would give other names of friends. And sadly, most of them weren't communists, but they just did it to keep themselves out of trouble. Okay? So we're gonna show you a clip now from the movie The Majestic. Let me give you a little bit of background on what's happening. Okay? There is a film producer played by, um, Oh gosh, I can't think of his name. It'll come to me. Anyway, um, he is a film producer during this time period, and he has been blacklisted because they believe he is a communist. Someone else gave his name. So um, he doesn't want to face trial. He doesn't want to go before HUAC. So um, he goes out and he goes driving. He's mad, and he gets in an accident, and he hits his head, and he has a concussion, and he forgets everything. He forgets who he is and everything. He winds up in this tiny little town by where he had his accident, and they believe he is this guy from World War II that they thought had died, and that he came back, he was alive, because he looked kind of like him. And so this town welcomes him in, thinks he's this World War II hero, blah, blah, blah. Well, eventually, his memory starts coming back, and he realizes he's not near as good a guy as this World War II vet really was. And so um, he finally has to go and face the music, and he goes before HUAC, and that's what you're going to see here in this testimony. It's quite powerful. Let's check it out. So in the movie, you saw that he refused to testify, and he didn't even mean to give them a name. But actually, that name was the person that turned him in, believe it or not. So he ends up getting out of it, even though he refused to cooperate. Well, there was a real group. That's a, a fiction based on fact. Okay, in this case, there was a group that refused to testify on the grounds of the First Amendment. They said, I don't care what you say, we have the right to be a communist in this country, don't we? So they stood up and they refused to do anything. They were called unfriendlies. These were called the Hollywood Ten. They were called to testify, but refused. They said it was unconstitutional to do so, and all ten of them were sent to prison, believe it or not. But they were really considered heroes at this point. They became the guy in the movie because they refused to give information or give someone else's name because everybody was afraid. All right, a um, little bit more about HUAC and what was going on. HUAC also created a blacklist. I mentioned that to you earlier. They basically wrote down a list of people who they believe had communist tendencies in Hollywood and ruined their lives. Over 500 people's lives were completely ruined because of this blacklist. Um, because you know you know Hollywood is, especially with women. Once you're past a certain age, they don't want you anymore. You know how that goes? You only got that, what, maybe 10 years if you're lucky. So a lot of people completely were kicked out and never got to come back. Here are some names or faces of people maybe you'll recognize. These are some of the big names. Just a second here. Turn that back on. 
Um, here you'll see a picture. There were people that also protested what was going on with this blacklist. For example, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, big names in the day, uh, in the 50s, led protests against HUAC. And here you'll see they're, they're out protesting free, the Hollywood 10. It is their right for the First Amendment and stuff like that. Now I'm going to show you another little video. It's about 10 minutes long. And it's about a family that was affected by the blacklist. His dad was uh, a part of the blacklist. And you'll see what happens to them. Okay, with the Khan family, you saw that he refused to give names. And so they moved to Mexico just so that they wouldn't get picked on. He was hoping to start his career. He was a writer. The only way, I'll tell you the end of the story, we didn't watch the end. Um, he basically got a fake name and he started entering scripts with a different name. And he was allowed to come back in. But imagine how that would affect your family and affect your life. I mean, it's really sad. It's hard for us to even imagine. I mean, I'm telling you that it doesn't just take your job away, but it also affects who you have as friends because people left you because you were the outcast, you were the communist, and none of it was true. That's what's horrible. It was another witch hunt. We were just taking people down for no reason, and we'll see what ends up happening to the people that are in charge of that. Okay, so a lot of things are happening throughout the country where we're hunting communists. The first one had to do with Harry Truman. He started a federal loyalty program in 1947 that said all government workers were subject to investigation. They investigated 3.2 million people in the government work field. And I want you to imagine these people. These are like your postal workers, your, your people that work for the government. Those seem like communists to you? I'm sorry, but I think they're pretty patriotic for the most part. Well, if you can imagine, um, 2,900 people resigned as a result of this program. 212 were fired, and not one of them was allowed to see the evidence against them which is really illegal in our country. Should be, but it, it, it was happening. Um, and if you look at this cartoon over here, you're gonna have a couple of cartoons on your test. So I wanna go over a couple of them here. Um, notice it says, it's okay, we're hunting communists. And you see the Committee on Un-American Activities, you see how they're running everybody over, trying to get to their, their communists in the country. We also had the McCarran Act. The McCarran Act, uh, basically, Congress decided that Truman's loyalty board didn't go far enough, that he only investigated government workers. So they basically said it was unlawful for any American citizen to plan any action that might lead to totalitarian dictatorship in the U.S. Now, what in the world does that mean? So what might make you think someone's going to lead a dictatorship coming into our country? Oh, Siri, you read a book about Stalin. You're guilty. Oh, you're good at codes. You're guilty. You're good at uh, computers. You must be guilty. He's good at science. You must be guilty. I mean, those are the things they used to find people guilty for the McCarran Act. It was absolutely ridiculous. There was nothing really to it, but they used it as a blanket to find anybody that they could. Truman actually vetoed it. So in this case, he did the right thing. He said, in a free country, we punish men for the crimes they commit, but never for the opinions that they have. Would you believe, though, people were so afraid of communism that Congress enacted it over his veto. So they were definitely going to hunt down those people. And I love this cartoon because it really shows what was happening. They are completely shredding the flag of America by doing it's a very good analogy, isn't it? Then we had a big event, uh, the Alger Hiss trial in 1948. We mentioned this when we did our We Didn't Start the Fire song. Hiss was a former State Department official. Um, well, there was a former communist spy named Whitaker Chambers who accused Hiss of spying for the Soviet Union. However, by the time uh, Chambers came forward, there it was too much time had gone by. So... They couldn't find him guilty of that. By the way, Congress, Richard, Richard Nixon, the congressman, headed this charge. He used this to kind of get on the ballots and become popular, and he later became vice president because of leading this charge against communism. Kind of interesting. That's a picture of him there. Um, Chambers produced microfilm of government documents that had been typed on Alger Hiss's typewriter. And just like you have 
like things with your writing that are original to you. A typewriter has the same kind of thing. It has ink that pools in certain areas, hits differently, okay? Well, they did find that the typewriter was probably his. However, too many years, as I said, had passed to charge him with espionage or spying, so they convicted him of perjury because he lied on the stand. Uh, and they sent him to jail for lying. And as Alger has said, I am amazed until the day I die, I shall wonder how Whitaker Chambers got into my house to use my typewriter. He, of course, said he was set up. His claimed he was innocent all the way to the end and that Chambers had actually forged the documents. That's up here on top there. And in the 1990s, now that we were getting along with the Soviets a little bit better, um, cables released by the National Security Age Agency seemed to prove that he actually was guilty of spying. So maybe he did deserve to go to prison. Our next big event is the Rosenbergs, and you've heard about these guys before too. 1949, uh, the Soviets exploded their first atomic bomb as a test. Experts had predicted it would have taken them three to five more years to do that. And people began to wonder if communists were within our atomic bomb project and that they were leaking the secrets. So they started investigating. In 1950, German-born physicist Klaus Fuchs, because we took a lot of those um, German physicists after World War II, and we allowed them to come to the United States so we could use their talents. Um, he admitted giving the Soviets information about the atomic bomb, but it doesn't stop there. This is Klaus Fuchs over here in the picture. Well, the Rosenbergs were implicated for this situation. Um, he basically said that they were connected. Now, these two people were minor activists in the American Communist Party, and they were also Jewish. So they claimed that this was a minority issue and they were being picked on because they were communists and because they were Jewish, not because of what was actually really evidence. Uh, they denied the charges and decided to plead the fifth. What does it mean to plead the fifth? What's that? Right. Right. You have the right not to say anything because it might incriminate you. So you can just say, I plead the fifth and not answer. And that's what they did. But you can imagine back then, they made them look more guilty, didn't it? So that was a problem. Uh, their chief witness was actually Ethel's brother, David Green Greenglass. He was a machinist on the atomic bomb project. Well, he had, I wouldn't say accidentally, but he had leaked some secret information to his brother-in-law when they were having a picnic one night. And that was the information that got to the Soviets. Many believe that Ethel was innocent right up to the end of this case, uh, but the government was basically playing her to get her to testify against her husband, if you remember that. They say, you either testify against him or you're gonna die too. Well, she didn't know anything. So both of them were found guilty. People all over the world felt evidence was way too weak and yet they were found guilty. Um, they had two children. They were sentenced to death. They appealed to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court refused to overturn the decision. And you can see we've got protesters on all sides, right? Burn all reds versus, hey, let's reconsider what's happening with the Rosenbergs. Judge Kaufman made a famous quote at the end of this case. He pronounced this crime worse than murder because it wasn't just murdering one person. He gave them information to be able to murder our entire country. And so that's kind of a famous quote. They were both sentenced to the electric chair and they were killed in the electric chair. They left behind two sons. They were the first and only US civilians ever executed for spying in the United States. Civilians, anyway. Well, again, in the 1990s, we got more information from the Soviets that showed that Julius probably was involved. There was absolutely no evidence against Ethel. She was innocent. And another thing that I found interesting, the brother has now admitted that he lied on the stand because they were threatening his family. And if he didn't testify against his brother-in-law, they would have hurt or killed his kids and his wife. So that's why he testified against the family. 
So sad. Okay, those are the children right there. They've since done interviews about what it was like. They basically were adopted to another family that was American, wholesome, you know. Okay, well, the guy.